Coming up next, an iconic singer-songwriter tells the story of one of the lowest points of his life. He was going through a tour divorce. Uh, he had excessive writer's block. His record label had just taken everything from him. And he was on the verge of quitting his own band. This is when he ran away to L.A. and he hid away in a hotel. A movie executive wanted him to write a song for a major film. And just like that, inspiration struck. He actually broke two strings on his guitar when he was writing this amazing song, but he just kept playing. He knew it was going to be a hit, and boy, was it ever. Uh, the way he came up with the title of this and the whole song, it's just amazing. We get the story from the icon himself coming up next on Professor Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you love the history of music straight from the artists who created them, you're going to want to be a full-time part of this channel by subscribing below. Make sure that you hit the bell so you always get our daily features. We have so many great interviews. Also, check out more content at our Patreon to become an insider. All right, I'm excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations. This is where featured artists reveal rare stories about their biggest songs, their biggest albums, or greatest albums, along with fascinating insight about their careers that you won't find anywhere else. Today, we have a special story of a song that made history. It was number one for 18 weeks on the mainstream charts. Now, it wasn't ever released as a single at this time, but if it had, it might have set the record for the most weeks at number one. It was part of the hit movie soundtrack for the 1998 blockbuster film City of Angels starring Nicolas Cage and Meg Ryan. Talking about Goo Goo Dolls, Iris. And I don't want the world to see me. John Resnick and his band Goo Goo Dolls had just come off their breakthrough song, Name, uh, which dominated mid-90s radio. After busting through, the band found out that due to a bad record contract, they didn't make anything. In fact, they didn't have much at all to their name. John was in bad shape. He was going through a tour of divorce, and he was experiencing extreme writer's block. I mean, he was so down, he was prepared to quit his own band. So he ran away to L.A. and uh, was met with a challenge. A movie executive wanted a theme to a major film. He stole away in a hotel, and he wrote a classic when he was in absolute peril. John Resnick tells the amazing story of Iris Next, how he got the title, how he wrote the intimate lyrics, and also about the concert in front of 50,000 New Yorkers when it was pouring down rain, and, you know, the promoters tried to make him stop the show. They were worried that he'd get hurt, or somebody would. He walked out, and he rocked Iris in a life-affirming moment. Tell you, this is one of the best videos uh, we have. It really is. It's just an inspiring uh, tale of this song. I've been waiting a long time to release this. We had it in limited release before with Vivo, but now we have the whole thing right here. As we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses I sport here on the daily. If you're looking at getting a new pair of frames or sunglasses, do yourself a favor and go to zenny.com. They have amazing variety. And you know what? Actually, you can download Zenny's new app onto your phone. It's really cool. You can select there and, and shop there. Do it today, Zenny. Here is John Resnick with the story of Iris. And I, give up forever to touch you. I mean, this is a song that, it just is one of the greatest songs of all time. It just is. No, um, thank you. 18 weeks, a record. It was kind of a weird time. <laughs> Because in the 90s, Billboard, they didn't release the single because the record label wanted you to buy the, the album, which I thought yeah. was pretty cool because I want people to buy the album because, you know, there's, there's a larger batch of songs here. But 18 weeks, man, I mean, that's just mind-boggling. Yeah, it was pretty... <laughs> Surreal. It's, it's freaky, man, yeah. you know? I mean, like, these are great things that happen to you as a person, but they can also kind of you up at the yeah. same time emotionally it's such a strange thing to feel like this kid from buffalo you know who was sort of you know i was, I was a freaking outcast you know uh, from the east side of buffalo and then this this happens to you and it's like one day you literally go from one day you got nothing right and you're driving around in a van to the next day you're sitting in a private plane with 
a beautiful girl that you've never seen before. And you're like, what the f*** is going on here? <laughs> this is crazy. Right. This is crazy. And Robbie and I used to tell each other all the time, don't get used to this. Don't get used to this. This is an awesome neighborhood, but we're just, we're just passing through. And I don't want the world to see me. Tell me about approaching you to write the song for City of Angels. Writer's Block, you're yeah. actually ready to quit the band. I mean, you were yeah. really going through a lot of writer's block. Tell me that whole yeah. story. Well, I was getting divorced, you know, and, and we had had uh, some success with a uh, boy named Goo. I always kind of felt like it was a little bit of a tip of the hat to boy named Sue, right? Yes, Johnny absolutely. Cash, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But name is also not only that as, as far as a track on, on the album, but it was an accident when you wrote it. I always heard the story that you were strumming just kind of messing around with chords and yeah. stuff. And because yeah. it's in a strange tuning. I mean, yeah, it, tell me that story. That's a, that's a great story. Well, we were, we we're a three piece. Um, we were a three piece band. And I was also such a huge fan of Who's Could Do. And Soul Asylum, you know, to a lesser degree. That whole sound, I could relate to that whole, they had this great music scene there. And I could relate to it being from Buffalo, which is basically oh, yeah. you know, just east of the Midwest. Songs like Hardly Getting Over It. And Paul's ballads. I mean, Who's Screw Do and Replacement Ballads. They're just like, that's what... Unsatisfied. Oh my God, man, <laughs> answering machine? You know, it's crazy. And I think that was part of what the abrasiveness of their sound. There was so much beauty underneath it. Oh yeah. I mean, there's songs that I listen to, like Divide and Conquer, when I, or, or Games. That, yeah. that song kills me when I hear it because I'm just, I listen to the lyrics and like what he's saying, you know? Uh, yeah, you know, I could be someone. It's, it's layers. Then, yes. One of the things that I, I'd started delving into was, was uh, using open tunings, alternate yeah. tunings. And, you know, Mould did that, you know, to create this sort of sonic thing where there's like, you're filling in space. Right. Like, you know, we're not Rush. You know, right, it's right, like right. Robbie, Robbie's thumping eights. Boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom. That was, that was a trick that, that I think Mould did really well. I read that you were, when you were kind of struggling, you are like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. You had a post-it note that you're writing it down on, right? The tunings? Yeah, the stuff. tunings. I yeah. still do that. <laughs> I still do that. Or I'll put tape on the back of the guitar and I'll have a tuner and I'll write the tunings down on it. Cause I forget, I forget. But then we wound up in this, you know, we signed, you know, such a typical, like, <laughs> friggin' cliche story. Right, right. We got ripped off by the record company. They took right. everything. Of course they did, you know? <laughs> um, I just, you know, I was, I was kind of discouraged and, and, I was, and I was feeling down because I, things weren't working out at home. And I kind of just ran, ran away to Los Angeles. I was hiding out in a hotel, just trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And my manager, Pat Magnarella, calls me and he's like, hey, this guy Danny Bramson from Warner Brothers, the guy that put together all the soundtracks, you know, oh, for yeah. films and stuff. He's, you know, we sat down, we talked about it, we saw the movie, and then it was like, okay. And I went back to the hotel, started, started messing around, playing it. I, and my guitar, I had broken a couple of strings on the guitar. I, I didn't want to go and get strings for my guitar, so I just kind of sat there. There were like four strings on the guitar, and I kind of and, and I tuned them all the same. That was back in the day when you could take a four-string guitar into a music executive's office and go, "Okay, check this out. I got two lines and this." <laughs> and he's like, "Man, that's great. Let's do it." And I was yeah. like, "Okay, right." And then we did it. You know? Three, four time too, like Piano Man, Sweet Baby James. I mean, those are yeah. songs that have that three, four time. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, I, I didn't realize that it was. I wasn't really thinking about it. Once again, it's one of those things where it's just, like, you know, and like, like, I 
I love the fact that I have no musical education. Oh, yeah. I'm grateful for it. You know, I mean, like, I get together with these guys, and they're monsters. I mean, musicians, like, musically, they're, they're just monsters. I was ashamed to play my guitar in front of these guys because <laughs> I was so bad at it compared to them. You know yeah. what I mean? And then I'm like, nah, but I do what I do. It took a long time to get that straight. Right. You know? And they do what they do, and it works. Well, the moment of truth in your life. The name Iris, I always read that it was inspired by, you read the magazine, and there was yeah. a country artist that had that name, Iris or Iris something. Iris Dement, kind of, yeah, the, kind the of singer. Stuck with you. I was sitting on a friend's sofa looking at an LA Weekly. And I got a phone call and they were like, look, you need a name for the song. And I was just looking through the, through the LA Weekly as I was on the phone and I'm just like, Iris, call it Iris. And that was it, you know? It. And the mandolin, too, is like one of the, yeah. the most famous mandolin pieces in a song. Tim Pierce played that. Of but. course. They wouldn't let me, and I'm glad, because I'm glad. But he, he's, I'll tell you what, man, Tim Pierce, it's amazing that you know about that guy. Yeah. You really are the professor. <laughs> <laughs> when something got beyond my capacity as a musician, like he would just come in and just lift the song up. It's incredible. Record of the year, song of the year, Grammys. I mean, it just it was such a monster, the song. And the movie, anytime anybody thinks of the movie, they think of the song. Yeah. I want to ask you about the first part of it because it starts out, the music comes in, and then the second that you hear your voice, like it's such a perfect way for the voice to come in there, give yeah. up forever to touch you. I want to ask you about a specific line the closest to heaven that I'll ever be. Yeah. You probably know this, but Mark Kelly had that, the astronaut, uh -huh. had that put on his wife, Gabby Giffords, the senator, had it put on her ring, engraved in the inside of her ring. Are you ring. serious? Yeah. Whoa, man, that's crazy. <laughs> Isn't that cool? That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Captain uh, Mark Kelly, who, wow. uh, yeah, a great astronaut, and of course, Gabby Giffords, a yeah, great yeah. survivor of that, yeah, that accident, yeah. you know, that shooting. That's just amazing. The astronaut wrote in her ring, you're the closest to heaven that I've ever been. He heard that line and in an interview he talked about it. It's wow. really cool. I'm getting goosebumps. Cause all I can taste is this moment. All I can taste is this moment. All I can breathe is your life. I mean, is your right? How did, I mean, how did you come up with that, man? And that's like really poetic. Like I said, I was, my, my marriage was done and I was hiding out. In LA. You're kind of putting yourself in the role of Nicolas Cage. Well, I don't know if I was doing it on purpose. Yeah, but, just you kind know. of. But when I saw the movie, you know, I, I, I went back to, to uh, Wings of Desire, which that film was based on. Right. Which is a great movie. It was always one of my favorite movies. And I, I went back and I watched that. And I was just sort of like, well, if I was this guy, what, what would I say to this girl? You know? And just, just wanted, I just wanted to be him. You know, like, wow. It's like you give up your immortality just to feel something. It's kind of weird. It's kind of strange because most people would give anything to have that immortality. And this, this guy wants the opposite, which is great, you know. And to me, too, it was sort of like the whole story for me in my mind the, the interpretation of it is just that wanting to feel human and, and he's so naive about what being human means. Like, you know, you, you know, it's like, how do you describe a punch in the face to someone? Right. You know, it hurts. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't know until you, there's no way to describe it. Yeah. Like, the best way for me to describe a punch in the face to you is to punch you in the face. Right. You know, and now you know. You know, it's like the best way to describe what being a human being is, is to just be one, yeah. you know, and it, just that longing for connection. And that's kind of, you know, like a vague theme that, that seems to run through the lyrics of the music. Cause I don't think that they'd understand. The chorus is so much you though, cause it almost feels like you stepped out a little bit of that character don't want the world to see me. Yeah. So I don't think that they'd understand. I mean, it's almost like there's a lot of John in that, you know, yeah. to me. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, that is a little weird that I would write that when this guy, you know. When everything's made to be broken, that's mm -hmm. a very yeah. resonant. Um, yeah, it just kind of worked, right? Yeah, it, <laughs> it just kind of worked. I, I don't, you know, once again, I don't know. It just worked. You can't fight the tears that ain't coming or the moment of truth in your lies. And everything feels like the movies. Man, you're vocal on, you bleed just to know you're alive. Man, yeah. that's yeah. just well, like thanks. passion, man. Yeah, you bleed just to know. I mean, that was a gift. And I don't mean a gift in no. the sense that, oh, I'm gifted. No. That was a gift yeah. from whatever part of the universe it came from. If you don't believe in that stuff, that's fine. I don't care. Because, like, the song's already here, and then you take it to there with that vocal. I didn't take it there. Right, right. I didn't take it there. That sh was put here by something, not me. <laughs> greater than one me. Yeah. Something bigger than me. Well, another thing is that Avril Lavigne got married to that song. Yes, she did. <laughs> I do believe she did. Yeah, she loves that song. And she's just like such a sweetheart, good yeah. person. Yeah. You know? Well, and also Taylor Swift, yeah. arguably the biggest pop star in the world right now. Yeah. And yeah. one of her favorite songs and the performance you guys sang together, great performance. She was great. I was so taken by her just because... You know, she was so young, and she had her sh together so well. Like, I mean, yeah. I walked in, somebody met me, she came over, she met me, she walked me around the stage, said, look, well, I think we're going to try to do something like this. That yeah. is, she was very in control of her show. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, this is your house. I respect what you want. Yeah. And, uh, and we did it. It was, it was awesome. She was amazing. Just so cool. Well, your performance at the free concert in Buffalo when it's raining, like that mm -hmm. is one of the most yeah. amazing live performances. I love that performance. Yeah. That was like the rain's coming down and you're just you're in the moment, man. Yeah, that was one of those that was one of those things once again where it's like I just felt like the universe just gave us a break. Like when it started pissing down rain on <laughs> fifty thousand people or whatever it was, you and know, they're all and, singing every line. And they're singing every line, and, and then and then you know they were like, you, you know, we're gonna have to stop. We're gonna have to stop. And I'm like, if we stop, I'll never be able to show my face in this city again, because everybody will just be like, you pussy, you stopped. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about this very personal song. What's your take on it? What's your take on Goo Goo Dolls? Still recording good music. What does the song mean to you? The memories, everything. Share it below. Let's have a great discussion. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe right now. And make sure to look us up on Patreon for even more content and to help support keeping this a daily channel, music curation all the time. It's all about keeping the music alive. Till next time. Three chords and the truth, my friends.